Sure. Welcome to Walk About the Galaxy, the reunited astronomy podcast where the science is universal, the opinions are personal, and the quarks are back in town. Woo! We were never out of town, but we're back in we're back in podcast town. We are Strange Charm Up and Top, the Astro Quarks, also known as Josh Caldwell, Addie Dove, Hannah Sargent, and Jim Cooney. And we even got the order right. Coming to you from the Walkabout Studio, near the Walkabout Studio, the virtual Walkabout Studio at the University of Central Florida. Remember to subscribe to us on all platforms, including YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Our YouTube feature, our YouTube videos now feature existence, which was something that you could not count on. (laughs) Uh, a few weeks ago. Follow the Astroquarks on TikTok, where we once published a video. We are also at www.walkaboutthegalaxy.com, where you can see how to order a walkabout shirt like this and support STEM education at the same time. You can contact us also at wtg at ucf.edu and do contact us that way if you order a shirt so we can get it to you as soon as possible. Our stumper today is, Jim, for you, Bad Guile. All right. All you right. Ready for it? You I'm ready for it. it. Yeah. Okay. Who is the best bad guy? The Borg Queen. It's multiple choice. The Borg Queen. This is going to be tough for Hannah. Thanos. <laughs> Thanos. Emperor Palpatine or Lord Voldemort. So you have four major genre franchises, arch villains. The Borg Queen, Thanos, Emperor Palpatine, or Voldemort. Uh, let's start with you, Jim, to welcome you back from your hiatus. Uh, this is going to be the whole podcast. I have some very strong feelings on this. Uh, oh, good. So, first of it's all... It's been all pent up. Uh, if any of you says the Borg Queen, I will slap you virtually across the face. She is the worst. Why, because you're sexist? No, no, no. I love a good evil villainess, but uh, that ruined the Borg. That was that was the whole idea of the Borg. The scary part about the Borg was that there was no personality. They were all just a collective, and it was terrifying. And then they introduced the Borg Queen, and that ruined everything. I, I hated oh. that with a fiery passion, because I thought the Borg was such a great villain species in Star Trek. It was... I mean, you know, we work in for it's years. Going on to the Cardassians, it was just like it was so terrifying. They were it was so well done, and then they absolutely ruined it by you got to have a bad person. So they made a bad person mm-hmm. and whatever. I mean, it was played well, and you know, whatever. But I, I hated that. The correct answer is Thanos uh, because yeah. Thanos wasn't entirely a bad guy. Mm-hmm. You no, know, it's like uh, I like these kind of kind of uh, he's bad, but. He kind of had the right idea. There's too many people in the world, and uh, I don't really want to kill half the world or anything like that, but uh, he had kind of decent motivations, at least at the beginning, and uh, I like a good conflicted villain, so Thanos is the right answer. Oh, interesting. Okay. I'll hold my thoughts on that. Uh, Addie, what do you think? I'm giving Hannah well, as much time as possible for her. To, she's she's furiously Googling who Googling. all these people <laughs> are over there. Who? <laughs> <laughs> now I want to say the Borg Queen just to make Jim angry. Um, I but I don't think it is the Borg Queen. Um, who, I I don't I don't know. Like Voldemort is really like the fact that he splits himself and like does all these crazy. Like he's a he's a he's a bad guy, mm-hmm. and he's a guy. Like a, mm-hmm. he started off as a human. And then, like, mm-hmm. morphed into this really terrible, terrible thing. I don't know. I'm, I guess I'll go with Voldemort. I don't have a strong opinion. I don't have a strong opinion on this, unlike Jim. Okay, all right. Unlike Jim. Okay, Hannah, do you have any opinion, strong or weak? Well, funnily enough, I don't have strong opinions. <laughs> uh, on this. Oh, on this. What if you've included uh, Elon you, Musk? I'm just kidding. You know about Oh, yeah, he's crime. the worst. Oh, he's the worst because he's, like, an actual villain. <laughs> so, an actual super villain. Uh you you at least are familiar with Palpatine from Star Wars. I know of Palpatine. Emperor, I know of right? Voldemort, obviously, because British. Right. British villain. <laughs> um, and I do know Thanos. And actually, to be fair, I probably would go Thanos because he, he's really upsetting to what is very convincing as a villain. Like, I don't like him. 
Yeah. Therefore, what? effective villain. Okay. Yeah, and I think that's what? a different point than Jim's point that he was like actually sort of a good guy. Yeah, not know. good, but he was at least like his motivation. It, like he wasn't cartoon evil. He was kind of like he wanted mm-hmm. to fix the problem, and then he went way too far in fixing the problem, and he was bad. Yeah. But like, it was like a believable human villain. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which yeah. makes it terrifying. Yeah, 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 yeah. I agree. Hmm. I I would say that uh, Thanos is definitely the wrong answer. Oh, because oh. because Thanos is the stupidest of the bunch. He's, He's so that stupid. Hugely intelligent sometimes. Thinking that, oh, to solve the population problem, I'll kill half the people. Well, guess what? The population doubles every 40 years. <laughs> so you're going to, your, your, your brilliant solution is idiotic. And, I suppose, uh, well, not entirely. If he killed half the population, it was all like the reproducing the half the, women, the population. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or all the men. Or, but it's probably or maybe especially all the men, only although, all the women. Well, if he killed away, all the men, so. the women would figure it out and figure out a way. We would, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I I can't go with Thanos because he's such a stupid idiot. Doesn't understand anything about exponential growth and population growth, and that's his whole thing. It's like solving <laughs> population problem. So uh, and Palpatine's too smarmy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Voldemort. I, I totally get what you like say about the bored queen. Um, I definitely loved the way she was portrayed in uh, First Contact, but I think I'm going to go with Voldemort also. Oh, and, so we should, so yeah. we need to have a Thanos versus Voldemort off oh, super, yeah, super villain. I don't know the the magic wand and the I don't know those stones. I guess are sort of all powerful. Well, anyway, today we'll talk well, I was about. Say, but there's also a new twist because the the Borg Queen features in the new Picard. Also, there's a new apparently spoiler. a new twist on the Borg Queen. That's it's not a spoiler. It's like in the previews. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Calm down, Jim. Jim gets really touchy about the Borg Queen. Well, today we'll talk about scrambling the planets in our solar system and the early universe, among other things. But first, this episode of Walk About the Galaxy is brought to you by the laws of thermodynamics. If you're not sure how to get your entropy, energy, and temperature in order, just pull out the new and improved laws of thermodynamics, neatly divided into four easily digestible sections. From the zeroth law's lighthearted definition of thermal equilibrium to the second law's soul-crushing explanation for the inevitable heat death of the universe, the laws of thermodynamics have it all. Fitting easily in your purse or pocket and taking up negligible space on your digital storage device, never leave home without the compact, indispensable classic, the laws of thermodynamics. Invented for life. Invented for life. They're pondering. They're pondering invented for life. I've heard that, but I, uh, I can't remember what it is. I'm gonna go with yeah. GE because I would go with GE. I think GE was GE's last not week. A bad, I... Yeah, it's not a bad guess, sort of thematically, uh, for what the laws of thermodynamics we're going for here. It's true. I keep Nobody's... thinking of like we bring good things to life. Was that GE? I think so. From last week, <laughs> I don't know. Possibly. <laughs> um, we I, give us a hint. Give us a hint. It has to do with. Um, heating things well it's this is know. not this we're this this this, this uninteresting this is some great uh, thing does this, this is some great stuff here we're crushing it with <laughs> yeah. this thing it, it's yes. uh Bosch, the appliance uh oh, uh, oh i would Bosch. never have got that they they make ovens among other things and but dishwashers. so many many Bosch people dishwasher. make ovens yeah i have a i have a quick rant about moon night that we mentioned oh, yeah. last time uh, I think you might share this rant, Addie. I do. That uh, this is the Marvel character who is uh, got dissociative identity disorder uh, and is possessed by an Egyptian god. And to solve some problem on a recent episode, they needed to know, they needed a star map, but the star map was created 2,000 years ago. So to decode it, they had to know what the sky looked like 2,000 years ago. And the only way they could figure out how to do that was to magically change the entire universe back in time 2,000 years 
condemning but, but it wasn't even changing the sky the it was just somehow spinning stone. the sky back in time 2000 years it's spinning yeah he spun the sky i mean all this all the objects in the sky spun back in time Whoa. instead of doing what addy just using a planetarium software that lets you go back 2000 years just any, any, yeah. yeah exactly any free freaking planetarium software yeah. or for a nice one you can pay 49.95 and dial it up on your laptop and type in sure. any date you want and like they have <laughs> that this you can fancy, imagine like, and you instantly see software. the whole sky yeah and they have this like fancy triangulation software they're using on an ipad or whatever and so like right. you could have had this software also yeah yeah that, that was that was absurd and then the consequences would not be so dire that's right <laughs> yeah Anyway, I just had to I had to air my grievance about that. Um, space Somebody news. Somebody needs a science uh, advisor. We had the private uh, crew come back from the International Space Station after some weather-related delays, and then the professional crew go up to the space station, right? Yay! Yeah, crew four and, launched. Right on a SpaceX Crew Dragon, mm -hmm. and they're there. I actually uh, like. I haven't been paying attention. Are there still uh, Americans and Russians aboard the International Space Station that are getting there are. along? There are, and I'm and I'm completely losing track of all the launches now. It just doesn't because it's not. It doesn't feel novel. It's already lost its. It's uh, only taken you not even a year in Orlando to yeah well, become blase about rocket launches. Kind of. It's just that well, all the time. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's been pretty yeah, busy. Yeah, the, cr so. the crew ones, they're still a little bit fewer and farther between, but way more than, like, they have ever been in my life. Yeah. Well, right. Like, ever, though, really, right? Because, like, shuttle wasn't this frequent. Uh, it w In its peak period, it was about, it was two or three times, three times, maybe sometimes even more than that, a year. And I, Yeah, and a year, but, like, we've had, I like, don't know. I, yeah. I can't believe that we've gone as well because most of the launches were from Russia for so long. And then yeah. since these launches have shifted to Florida, which hasn't been that long already, I'm like, oh, yeah, more crew launches. <laughs> oh. It's amazing it's... how quickly it like I move on. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't I don't I mean, the crew launches. What I care about is like, what's the rocket? I don't actually care that much about what's on the top of it. So if it's people or a satellite or whatever, I'm just like interested in the show of the rocket going up. So, yeah. Uh, the crew crew four for, is exciting because some of this is some of the newer class of astronauts, and um, they like one of them is a geologist. So Ooh, getting ready for the moon. Lots of moon stuff. Lo yeah. Lots of lots of rocks to study on the International Space Station, I guess. I know. Right. Uh, Osiris Rex, our friend uh, in space, which has uh, returned or is returning. Um, uh, some samples of the asteroid Bennu to Earth has been given a, a mission extension. A mission extension, yeah. So they, it did that. It basically dropped off the samples, and now it's still going through space, and it still has some fuel. Um, and so they have, uh, or it hasn't swung by yet. It will swing it by. It hasn't dropped its sample year. off yet. Yeah. Yeah, it's on its way back, and it'll swing by, and then they'll redirect it. Um, and they're calling the extended mission instead of Osiris Rex, they're calling it Osiris Apex. But like Osiris Rex was a full acronym. Acronym. So I'm confused about how they're changing it. I haven't seen what the I haven't seen the what decoder. the full acronym is. But yeah, but it's they're going to um, Apophis is the asteroid they're now going to try to check out, which is uh, an infamous asteroid that. Um, has been looked at a long time for a close I approach. So it has kill a, us all. Yeah, exactly. So it has okay. a close <laughs> approach in 2029. It won't kill us, um, but we thought for a while it might. Um, and it's a bigger asteroid. It's like the biggest asteroid that's going to get that close in a long time. So cool. Like I think people cool. from Earth will be able to see it with the naked eye. So oh no, Apophis. don't look up. Is 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 going to so. happen? Isn't it? <laughs> How big don't is look up. It's going to be a documentary. Uh, stand by. I don't know. Big ish. Is it is it bigger than Joshua Caldwell 
to 6902? Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's about the same size as Bennu, nearly a thousand feet at its longest point. Okay, that's tiny. I'll be surprised if we yeah. can see that. I won't it's see it. It's an S type asteroid. Sure. This article says we'll be able to see it, but I don't know. Coming really um, close. Speaking of really close, Mercury is really close to the sun. Mercury is really close to the sun. Good, interesting segue, segue there. Uh, good job. Uh, yeah, so just um, looking at recent news stories, some uh, some people have picked up on a recent abstract presented at Lunar and Planetary Science Conference, um, which is uh, proposing that Mercury's crust may be covered with diamonds, embedded Ooh. with diamonds, which is kind of cool. Um, like real diamond? Like what like size? Act like actual diamond. I don't know about the size, but so... I didn't actually know much about Mercury's crust, but apparently um, there's evidence for a, a sort of graphite layer in sort of the mid to lower crust um, on Mercury, which could be anywhere from like a, a, a few hundred meters to maybe on the scale of kilometers thick, um, which formed early is on. Pure carbon, right? Pure carbon. Um, so right. it was a flotation. Oh, so as, as, as when it was molten you know the graphite kind of floated um and then formed this crust and then during the late heavy bombardment which is when um just all of this dynamic kind of movement of rocks and things throughout the solar system bombarding everything um it's thought that during that phase it could have dug up and um and released a lot of um uh all of that impact could have caused the formation of diamonds basically um and a few years back, the Messenger mission uh, detected that there was possibility of carbon because there was these like low, um, uh, what should you call it, like low albedo areas, and um, but with high neutron counts, which suggested the presence of carbon. Um, and there's an upcoming mission that is that will be capable of detecting whether it is carbon or not. And anyway, so there's this recent abstract by Kevin Cannon um, looking at just doing some just early stage modeling and it does suggest there would be significant amounts of diamond so about 30 percent of the graphite would convert to diamond which is really cool it's like but, big hand so sized diamonds or are we talking about the uh, i don't right, know about the, the size question. of the diamond but in terms of quantity overall mass about 30 percent of, of the graphite would be in the form of diamond and they think maybe like one to three percent of the surface is is carbon based. So because the thing about diamonds is not like you get a whole bunch of diamond chips and you just sort of ball them up and yeah. then you've got a nice beautiful big diamond. Right. Yeah. So there, the, how many hope diamonds we got going on here? Yeah, yeah. There you yeah. go. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh so I I I don't know really in terms of the size of the diamonds, but this it really in, um makes the prospect of a lander to Mercury really quite interesting. Um see if we can dig up any diamonds so, so both diamonds and graphite are just carbon right and uh graphene is another uh form of just carbon so it all just sort of depends on how those carbon atoms put themselves together you know what's their molecular um you know what what sort of crystalline structure they organize themselves in so like graphene is this two-dimensional hexagonal sheets of carbon uh and um Diamond so is di some certain particular configuration of it, uh, and so it, it generally we think of it requiring intense pressures to yeah. put a lot of heat, the, a lot of pressure, and they think that these impacts um, on the mercury surface could provide enough of that. And then in reading that, I because I wasn't aware that um, some of the carbon rich uh, meteorites that we find actually have diamonds in them, which I didn't realize which is really cool. So there's like space diamonds that we've already like oh. um, being able to analyze, which I just thought was a really cool story. Because they also talk about diamonds, like diamond rain inside the giant planet sometimes, because again, you have these high pressure uh, situations also in there. And uh, so I just sort of wonder if these are like microscopic uh, diamonds. Yeah. That it's, that, it's the right molecular form to get the headline. Mm. That's what I'm well, we'll see. Speaking of launches, there's a Falcon 9 launching at this moment from the from Oh, really? The well, I might. Yeah. Our, our YouTube viewers might be able to see me looking out my window to see that launch. Um, 
so speaking of planets, there uh, is an interesting new take on our own solar system's in, uh, planetary history or dynamical instability, which also is uh, relevant to exoplanets, which we love to talk about all the different planetary systems and will be the topic of our trivia in a few minutes. Um, we've talked before about this sort of like giant planetary dynamical instability hypothesized to have taken place in our solar system like 500 million years, give or take, after the planets formed, where the planets all shuffled around. In fact, last time we were talking about Uranus, it may have not been the seventh planet when the solar system formed. Maybe it was the eighth, and Uranus, uh, Neptune was the seventh, and they swapped places in one of these instabilities. And uh, this new paper says, well, what is it exactly that triggers that instability? Because basically you need planets to move into resonances or cross resonances so that the orbits become very egg-shaped and cross each other's orbits so that then they have really close gravitational encounters and they go all over the place when that happens. And so then they're having close gravitational encounters with all the little stuff, the comets and the asteroids, and they go all over the place and smack into all the moons and make uh, new craters and all sorts of things that, that we can observe now. And uh, so this, this model uh, has something called a, a rebound uh, where in the early solar system, there you have planets forming and there's gas in this disk around the sun. And the planets have a gravitational interaction with that gas that generally leads to them drifting inwards towards the sun. Eventually, at some point, the sun evaporates that gas away, and it does that from the inside out. And so it starts sort of boiling off that disk from the inner edge, and that gas gets heated up and it goes away, and then the inner edge of that disk, that gas disk, moves outwards. So as that disk gets photoevaporated and disappears, it stops that inward drift of the planets. And in fact, as that inner edge of the disk is moving outwards, the edge is moving outwards. The gas isn't moving outwards. It's the edge of the disk that's moving outwards because the disk is being eroded by the sun. The planets can hook up gravitationally with that edge and drift outwards also. So that's where the rebound comes from as the planets are drifting in. And then the edge uh, photo evaporates and starts moving out and the planets rebound and start drifting out. And that gives you enough motion of these planets relative to each other to cause them to leave resonances or enter resonances or uh, have close encounters with each other and trigger these um, big planetary instabilities. And the way they test this, they ran a gajillion computer simulations. And one of their sort of um, uh, metrics for like saying, well, does this help explain what we see today in the solar system is looking at something called the angular momentum deficit and radial mass concentration statistic of the solar Ooh, is system. Is that been a sponsor? Sounds like a good sponsor. Does it make that, a good acronym? We should, I have never heard it does of it. Not, oh. It does not make a good acronym, but I will totally reach out to them about sponsoring an episode. Great. You know, say, hey, Great. we you know, we love to talk about you guys. Think about sponsoring Walk About the Galaxy. So yeah, for sure. the, um, the angular momentum deficit is the difference between the planar circular angular momentum of the planets and the total angular momentum. And Are you going too far down the rabbit hole? Is this a... Well... What I'm saying is there's a characteristic about how the planets... Thank you, Jim, for bringing me back up out of the rabbit hole. Good call. Good call. There's a, there's, a, there's a number, a single individual number that you can calculate based on the orbits of planets yeah. uh, that's related to how they're orbiting around. And then there's also another number that's related to how closely packed and massive they are. And if you plot those two numbers against each other, the solar system is one point. Then you do these gajillion simulations with and without this rebound. 
and you find that when you don't have the rebound, very few of your simulations end up producing planetary systems near the point that represents our solar system. And when you do include the rebound, you get a lot of simulations that do end up in the region of this uh, graph where the solar system plots, as well as where lots and lots and lots of exoplanetary systems plot, which look like they've had lots of crazy dynamical instabilities in their histories as well. Yeah, so I think that's really interesting because like if you just had the one, if you just had our solar system to look at, this would be intriguing, but you could never say anything concrete, right? Because like you said, it's like sometimes you can get this kind of a solar system with that's other right. Uh, but if you have our solar system and hundreds or thousands more to look at, then you can start to say more concrete things based on these, uh, based on these simulations. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's definitely yeah, like a real. Interesting... Good. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say it's sort of like a sea change in planetary science now that there are instead of for you know for all time studying one system, there literally are hundreds of systems, uh, multi-planetary systems to to study. By the way, can I say yeah, for a long time this? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Eddie. Oh, I'll say my side afterwards. I was just say for a long time the models along those lines, right? For a long time, people were just like trying to figure out how to mod make models that would match our solar system, and we had like very specific parameters to like get sort of distribution of mass that we have, and it was like hard to do sometimes even then. And then um, people started coming up with like, okay, well, but how do we explain like the late heavy bombardment on the moon, right? So this idea that there was like all these impacts sort of late in the history of the, of the sol late ish in the history of the solar system. And that required this upheaval. Um, and now we know maybe there was actually a lot more bombardment for that. It wasn't just that one time, but, um, uh, and like, so there's lots of these different pieces that tie together in our own solar system to tell us that there was all of this exchange, but like, it's really hard to see that now unless you look at all these little different pieces and then all these other planets that are in super weird configurations that couldn't have formed though the way they are now are way more are much more evidence of it it's definitely i mean we we definitely have a different story about how planetary systems form now than we did 30 years ago you know if you went into an Even intro like 10 years astronomy ago. yeah um i think I think, you know, starting maybe 20 years ago, we started to realize, okay, we have to make some serious revisions here. And it's really come into focus in the last 10 years, you know, what, what those revisions are. And it does involve some really exciting, you know, planets flying around all over the place and scattering things all over the place, like forming here and ending up in a completely different part of the solar system, a very uh, you know, it's like flying around over place, still taking place over, you know, long time scales, but uh, a very dramatic uh, rearrangement of uh, the planetary system over the course of millions and tens and hundreds of millions of years. Yeah, I, like think ours, we, I absolutely most of the, the way that Josh gets up, uh, uh, excited about orbital mechanics. It's, it's, it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I know. For some people, it's yeah, moon dust. System. For some people, it's orbits. You know, I don't know. <laughs> okay, well, Hannah, you were going to say something, but we we buried you down the rabbit hole. I was just thinking back to, because I, I was doing my physics undergrad degree 10 years ago now, um, and I'm trying to think what I was learning about exoplanetary systems, if if at all. And I don't really remember it. I don't. I think it was very minimal, but it could have been because I wasn't paying much attention and I didn't really do that great in my undergrad degree. But yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I don't really remember it at all. And it does seem like there's been this mass change in um, in how much work has gone on, and and just general understanding and the and getting to the point of teaching it in class as well, because there, there there is that extra time step from right. discovery to then integrating it into courses and things. Right, so, yeah, actually so, making it into the textbook. Yeah, yeah, I think it's it must be only the very recent courses where this is common knowledge now. Well, our trivia has to do with these exoplanetary systems. So uh, you will be shocked to know that there are multiple parts to this, but it's a sort of general exoplanetary knowledge trivia. So here are your questions about planets around other stars, exoplanets. Uh, we, what is, so we're talking about like 
the shuffling requires multiple planets in a system. If we're confirming that with looking at exoplanets, that's suggesting that there are multiple planets around single stars besides the sun that we know about so that we can study other systems that have lots of orbits in them. How many orbits? What's the most number of confirmed planets orbiting a single other star besides the sun? That's your first question. The second is, what's the largest exoplanet orbit that has been observed? And you can give your answer either in distance or orbital period. And uh, finally, how many confirmed exoplanets are there as of today? What's the number? And it, you know, oh, it's geez. a number that was like zero in our lifetimes, or at least my lifetime. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was point. like the middle nineteen so, nineties, right? Is when we first discovered discovered the first exoplanets. That's that's not that long. It's it's younger than uh, or older than our uh, our current batch of students, but uh, definitely not older than us. Right. Yeah. So ponder that, but don't Google it. While we uh, move now from the part of the universe that makes me very excited, which is, I guess, planetary orbital dynamics, to the part that makes Jim very excited, which is the very, very early days of the universe. Yes! So, uh... <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know why. you think that, uh, that it's much more interesting to study what's going on now, but I don't care about now. I care about back then. When I was a kid, I always wanted to be an archaeologist. You're old-fashioned. Yeah. So you were like He's a space archaeologist. Soul. Um, so, uh, th this, uh, th this isn't really a new result about anything we've uh, learned about the er early universe, but, uh, it's kind of the dawn of a new technique of learn, trying to learn about the early universe. So, uh, one of the things we're getting very, very good at in astronomy is doing these kind of all sky maps, uh, at various wavelengths. Uh, and it turns out that it can be very useful. Uh, for example, if you want to know what the you know the structure of the universe looked like in its early days, you just look really far away and look at, for example, hydrogen. Because, of course, as we all know, hydrogen is the most common thing in the universe. And so uh, you're always going to get emission from hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen, by the way, there's like three... Hydrogen comes in kind of like three forms in the universe, right? It's like you can have hydrogen that's ionized, so it's just like a proton... That is not going to be very helpful for trying to find in the early universe because that doesn't produce radiation in the typical way, right? It doesn't have electrons to fall from one level to another level or anything like that. So ionized hydrogen, not very helpful. Then you have atomic hydrogen. It's hydrogen by itself, a proton and a, an electron. And that's actually tremendously useful. There's a really famous transition in atomic hydrogen uh, that produces radiation that has a wavelength of... What's your favorite wavelength? My favorite wavelength of hydrogen. I, I have two favorite hydrogen wavelengths. Uh, okay. Lyman alpha. Ooh. Lyman alpha is, is one. one. That's not the one I'm talking about, though. Twenty-one centimeters is the other. Twenty-one centimeters. That's the awesome one, right? Uh, Twenty-one centimeters. So th that's a, this this little subtle transition in a hydrogen atom where, like, the electron flips from going from being aligned with the proton to anti-aligned, or vice versa, and you get this little bit of energy that's either released or uh, absorbed in that, and that light. We can you, we can look out at the universe and see where that light's coming from and kind of map out where stuff is in the universe. By stuff, I just mean where is H? Where's the hydrogen that's out there? Uh, and that's super you, useful. You, Obviously, that helps us map what our galaxy looks like. That helps us map what uh, the grander universe looks like. Because you you know even if I can't individually make out all these galaxies that are ten billion light years away, I can see the general glow from the hydrogen uh, that is in those galaxies. Uh, and and I'm going to interrupt for a, a, a random side note about that 21 centimeter emission is so ubiquitous and, and there's so much hydrogen. You can pick it up with a one meter diameter radio telescope uh, for that you can slap together for, you know, hundreds of dollars. Yeah, that's really it awesome. requires some know how, but but it's, you know, it's it's not something that requires, you know, Arecibo or something like that to see that emission. Right. You will get, of course, very, very poor angular resolution on a uh, one meter telescope looking at 21 centimeter emission, but you can still see it and you can kind of very broadly map out where the like the Milky Way galaxy is by doing a thing like that. Right. right? Uh, which is really awesome. And then if you have huge telescopes, if you have 
10 meter uh, and 100 meter radio dishes and stuff like that spread out all over the uh, world, then you can get pretty darn good angular resolution. You can map out what the distribution of hydrogen looks like. Uh, but it would be really great if we had more than just uh, that 21 centimeter line. Of course, many of the, the uh, transitions in hydrogen atoms, those uh, you lose some of that light because it's absorbed in other places. And all. Anyway, so the more things you can look at to map out the early universe, the better. And the newest one uh, that might be very useful, and we might be able to build a bunch of instruments to measure its uh, distribution in the sky soon, is hydrogen duty ride. <laughs> Uh, that's not how you're saying. Is that your favorite? Uh, is that your favorite uh, attraction at Disney World? <laughs> that in is your, what. Uh, that's what um, uh, Charm Cork is all about right now. She's on a duty ride because she has a little <laughs> spraying duty all over the place. <laughs> Um, hydrogen duty ride. So you've okay. been thinking, we can tell, the reason you haven't been with us, Jim, is because you've got the newest, babiest, littlest astro quark. That's Congratulations. true. I've been on a bit of a duty ride as well. Uh, and so that's why duty, that's why duty's on your brain. Duty is on my mind. And luckily, we got an article this week about duty ride. Oh, I don't think that's a How do you actually say it? <laughs> yeah. Duty ride. There is an R Deuteride. in there. So what is, what is hydrogen duty ride? Hydrogen deuteride is, so remember I said hydrogen come in kind of like three flavors. Ionized hydrogen that doesn't do anything, just regular hydrogen, and then molecular hydrogen. Hydrogen likes to bond with itself to make H2, right? Uh, and that's like if you find it in our atmosphere or something, that's how you're going to find it is, is H2 rather than just H by itself. Um, and that molecule, H, because that's, that's now a molecule, that molecule has its own set of interesting emission lines uh, that it produces, Hydrogen deuteride isn't actually two H's combined together. It's an H and deuterium, which is heavy hydrogen. And it turns out that H2 by itself doesn't produce all that many terribly interesting uh, emission lines, but HD, hydrogen deuteride, does uh, because of the slight difference in mass between the, you know, or the, not slight, but, you know, the difference in mass between the hydrogen and the deuterium. It, it has some funny electronic properties that cause it to have some fun, um, the uh, deuterium is uh, is r roughly twice as massive as the, uh, the as the hydrogen atom, right. and um, so is it. But it's not like is it electronic transitions or is it molecular or vibrational? It's, it's a work? rotational. It's a rotational thing. So I mean the the, the electrons right, prefer. Yeah. And now I'm going to forget which one is which. But the the electrons pack a little bit more tightly around one of them, the more massive one, I think, than the other one. Maybe it's the other way around, uh, and. That causes a little bit of a uh, an electric dipole moment, which, when you rotate it, produces uh, some energy. So it's a Emission. rotational mode thing. Uh, but anyway, I, I can't even remember now what the uh, maybe maybe somebody can look up what the uh, free wavelength of that is. But but why do we care about this frequency or this wavelength? Because then you can say you're mapping the sky in HD. Right, you're matching the <laughs> you are oh. matching the in HD. No, but That's it helps. Better it helps than you a beauty ride. determine whether. If you're only looking at one wavelength, maybe maybe I'm doing something systematically wrong. But if I'm looking at different things at different <laughs> wavelengths, then maybe I know that I'm actually mapping structure in the early universe correctly, rather than it's being you know this particular wavelength is being absorbed more than other wavelengths, and I, I'm missing something, something like that. So, so it's like a sanity okay. check. Yeah, yeah. The the more wavelengths at which we can map the early universe, the better. And and hydrogen. And Duty ride uh, is uh, there's a lot of it in the early universe because <laughs> the only place the only way you make deuterium in the universe is at the very beginning in the in near the Big Bang and and ever since then it's becoming less and less and less and less common and so it's more common in the early universe and you see a lot of it and we see those lines I think it's a pretty cool fun way to look map out the early we haven't done it yet because we need to build up the kind of instrumentation to do it but we're going to do it in the next and couple decades you watch and and the article also talks about how um, like like the process to to make the the fractionation ratios so so to look at the ratio of hd to h2 like the processes to make the relative amounts of those happen at different temperatures and under different conditions so if you if you are mapping both of those things and you look at the fractions then it can tell you like maybe what the processes were that got you to that that point 
So you can tell a little bit like how things happen differently in different parts of the universe. Right, right. So we're, we're cool. using this to kind of explore this era when galaxies, very the very first galaxies and the very first stars form, and that causes a huge you know output of light, which mm -hmm. then kind of reionizes the. And th this early era of the universe is hard to to study, and this is a cool way to do it. Well, deuterium is definitely you know you mentioned it's this got this primordial nature to it. And it's and that's exploited in planetary science as well. So one of the key measurements that's made in planetary atmospheres measurements is the D to H ratio, the ratio mm -hmm. of deuterium to hydrogen, uh, which uh, can be a diagnostic of how that object formed, how that atmosphere formed, uh, because as you said, it, that that quantity goes back. Uh, to uh, the original amount of deuterium available was set very early. And then uh, what is the loss process for deuterium? Why, why, where is it going away? Why is it going down? Well, it, it's, it, it's fused in stars. So deuterium is a, is a fuel in stars. And so you turn deuterium. You, you don't make deuterium uh, very efficiently in stars, but you fuse it to make heavier things. Uh, and okay. so it's kind of the, the total amount of deuterium is monotonically increasing largely because of stellar fusion. Decreasing. Yeah, decreasing. decreasing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. Okay. All right. Well, are you ready to uh, take a stab at the your barrage of exoplanet trivia question? Let's actually start with the first, with the last one. How many confirmed exoplanets are there? And we're going to start with Upquark, Hannah Sargent. I know they t they announce it and then I I read it and then I forget. I don't even like <sighs> 2000. Uh, 2000 she says. Jim 4800. 4800. Okay. Sort of still in the same ballpark astronomically speaking. Addy, what do you think? I'm going to say 7500. 7500. So you 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 guys went arithmetically in sort of equal increments, and it is the happy median. Uh, Jim is uh, close, 5,014 oh. as of okay. April 29th, 2022. So over 5,000 planets. There was recently an announcement. Now we've passed that 5,000 mark. So that's, that's what you're and that's remembering, like confirmed. Hannah. Confirmed. Confirmed. That's like confirmed, quote, unquote, it doesn't confirmed. include... Yeah, this gets a yeah, little too much like... there's huge numbers of candidates that are seen by like the right. candidates and so forth. but what exactly confirmation means is a little bit a little bit wishy-washy but yeah right yeah these exoplanet survey missions have lots of candidates like funny little blips and they're like this might be a planet but we need more data to rule out yeah. that it's not something else so there's thousands more than these 5000 that are candidates some of which observations are underway which may confirm them or not others mm -hmm. which we not you know it will take some future mission or or campaign to follow up on Anyway, 5,000 exoplanetary systems. What is the number of the most planets confirmed in an exoplanetary system? Hannah Sargent. Why do I always <laughs> have to set the bar? 18. 18. I think eight. I'm going to go with six. Six. Addy's on the nose. Nice. With eight. Nice. It's the Kepler 90 system. There is another system that may have eight or possibly even one or two more called Tau Ceti, uh, but uh, they're not confirmed. They're inferred. Uh, Kepler 90 is a uh, star not too dissimilar from our own sun, uh, about a little less than 3,000 light years away. Eight planets about the same number in our solar system, depending, of course, exactly how you want to find planets or whatever, but eight planets. Uh, however, the outermost planet in the Kepler-90 system is at the same distance from its sun-like star as the Earth is from the sun. So, yeah. So very, so very, very... Kind of yeah. But that's a limit so to the measurement to... method rather than what really exists out there. Ex that's true, except because there are all those planets and it looks like they have a kind of gravitational interlocking with each other and the nature of all those eight orbits that we can see, we know that if there were another like gas giant planet, like a Jupiter-style planet in that system, 
it has to be very far away. Otherwise, its gravity would screw up the orbits that we see. So there's nothing significant, at least mass-wise, between one AU, the distance of the Earth from the Sun, and in this system, the distance of the outermost known planet from the star, and 30 AU, which is the distance of Uranus from, or sorry, Neptune from yeah. uh, the Sun. So it is, while, while you're right, Hannah, we see these things close in. That's why we're able to like, see this system. But in this particular system, it's true that that's hmm. where all the big planets are. Yeah. They're in, in close. And that outermost planet that's wow. one AU away, it's like I said, the sun is, that star is like the sun. So its year is about as close to one Earth year. It's 11 months instead of 12 months long. Uh, and it, but it's a big old planet, 200 times mm-hmm. the mass of the Earth. Oof. So almost to Jupiter mass. I think Jupiter is 300 Earth masses. How are they all packed uh, in like that? That's crazy. I would have thought that that big one would have screwed up the orbits of those inner ones, but I guess... Uh... Yeah, the next the next one in, they have a mass for it as well, and it's less massive than that, but it is much more massive than the Earth. And then the inner ones, they don't have good mass estimates for them. Uh, so interesting system and very different, you know, than our, than our own. Uh, what is the largest orbit known for an exoplanet and you can give your answer either in multiples of the earth's orbit size or years that it takes for that planet to go around its star and this time we'll start with jim because he picked on hannah uh 110 astronomical units 110 astronomical units addy what do you think yeah i think it's really far I'm going to say like 250 AU. Okay. Reminder, AU is the distance of the Earth from the sun. Okay, I want to go 200 go AU. You're oh. going in the middle because that worked for Jim last time? No, I, actually, I was, gonna, I was actually going to say 200 AU. <laughs> okay. Well, you can say 200 AU. Uh, I, I guess Addy wins this, but it's kind of a three-way tie for, for lost because the answer is 7,500 AU. Whoa. What? And the planet takes 1.1 million years to orbit that its count. sun. This is a planet that we have seen telescopically. Oh, yeah. What is the name uh, of this it's, thing? I'm going to tell you right now. It has an adorable name. <laughs> the name is Coconuts to Be. Coconuts to Be. But okay. I like to say Coconuts to Be. So hypothetically, uh, we could have a planet orbiting that far away we, that we just haven't discovered. Absolutely. Absolutely. And in fact, Egotron is hypothesized to be such a planet. That's I'm the only person who calls it that. Um, but there's a hypothesized uh, object out there in the distant Kuiper belt. Um, but that's I don't not... actually think it's expected to be that far out. It's in the hundreds of AU, not the thousands. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. It's in hundreds. Yeah. Not, like, so where is 7,000 AU in our solar system? 7,500 AU in our solar system. Then you're in the s- sort of like transition to the inner Oort cloud. Yeah. They, so far. they have uh, an idea. I mean, th- that must be a highly eccentric orbit. Yes. I mean, uh, I don't, I don't know, the I don't know, if we know. Or how egg shaped that orbit is, but that, the object that the planet, Coconuts 2b, is uh, six times the mass of Jupiter. So it's getting up to what we would stop, stop calling a planet and start calling a brown dwarf. And in fact, when it was first observed, it was presumed to be a substellar object just cruising around in space. Then it was identified as orbiting this star on this very distant orbit. And a mass determination was made that is below the sort of nominal brown dwarf lower mass limit, which is 12 times the mass of Jupiter. But then we're getting into this whole thing about like, is Pluto a planet or a dwarf planet? It's more, says more about sort of like what people's definitions of things are than what the thing is in some sense. I have so many questions about this. I won't ask them all, but like how, how, with that large an orbit, like how do you determine that it is in orbit around that thing rather than just like you said? Yeah, that was my by. question too. Like you'd have to see a change in the direction of like you, you can't just 
Yeah, well, it's, it's close. Like a small arc of its orbit it would go it would go through in the time we've been observing it. That how would you possibly determine that it was gravitationally bound? Um, I so I don't know the answer except that I can speculate that in addition to astrometric measurements, which obviously are going to be really, really, really tiny and maybe irrelevant in this case, you may be able to see Doppler shift in. Uh, emission, thermal emission from this object, which could give you a pretty precise measurement of velocity of it and the star that it is orbiting. Right. I suppose you need differences least in, our, in our direction. And so that could be sufficient to uh, constrain an orbit. It is only 35 light like, years away. How does that compare it's, to like next door. other binary star systems that have some big separation? There are some stars that are have wide separations um, like that, uh, yeah. you know, some binary star systems that are widely separated. So, yeah, that's I mean, this one's a little bit sort of like, OK, is it a planet or is it a star that didn't quite make it big enough to be a star? And then people will say that, well, that's what Jupiter is, too. It's not a planet, <laughs> so, you know. Yeah. And then it just sort of gets like, OK, how, you know, at what point do you draw that? line. So right now we have a dotted line at about 12 times the mass of Jupiter to call something a brown dwarf. You have to be about 80 times the mass of Jupiter to actually be a star because that is a clear-cut physical thing. A star has nuclear fusion that it is or it isn't, right? Below that, then it's this whole sort of hand wavy. I'm waving my hands. It's this whole sort of wishy-washy <laughs> thing. I like that the survey well, is called coconuts. Good job, those folks. I do too. Coming up with that acronym. I, I agree. Yes. Yes. And I I like that this one is coconuts to be. Coconuts to be. While it, while it may have felt like rewinding the celestial sphere for 2,000 years, it was just another episode of Walk About the Galaxy. Give us five stars and we'll give us the universe. We'll give you the universe. We'll give us the universe too. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram to get all our updates and check out our website at walkaboutthegalaxy.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel where we're publishing all our episodes and hashtag shorts. Catch up on old episodes wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Twitter at walk underscore the underscore galaxy. And ask us questions anywhere using hashtag AskWTG. Our theme music was composed by Richard Jerusik. Production assistance is provided by Logan Basinger. Thanks to our areas. It our areas. I am losing it today. Thanks to our listeners in the Bay Area and around the world. Stay safe. I'm Josh Caldwell. I'm Addie Dove. I'm Hannah Sargent. And I'm Jim Cooney. We're the Astrocorks signing off until the next episode of Walk About the Galaxy. Duty. Duty. Duty ride. Come on. <laughs> Hannah won't say it. <laughs> no. Duty ride. Not, it's, it's not a word that we use. Hannah like, needs uh, herself to be okay. way more mature than we are. Sophisticated. <laughs>